If you have your Bibles this morning, I'm so excited to be here with you. Um, still in the afterglow of last week, but today I was praying all week, and I thought, God, what do you tell a church that's on fire? Like, what do you say on a Sunday after what we just had? I'm like, I feel like everything I'm going to say today could be a letdown from last week. It was just such an awesome week. And I was praying all week, and he said, Mark, I want, I've got a very simple thought for you. So I'm going to spend at least two weeks, maybe three weeks in this idea. But he said, Mark, I, I have a simple idea. I want you to get into Ocean's Church. Tell them they're not going to be a church full of sheep. You're going to be a church full of shepherds. And I heard it. I heard it crystal clear. And I understand that usually yeah, we understand that, you know, pastors are shepherd. You know, the Latin word for, uh, for pastor is actually shepherd. That's what it means. Translates shepherd. And I know that not everyone here is going to work at a church. About 3% of this tent will probably ever stand on this platform in some sort of public service. But what I want to ask you is, does that mean the rest of you are second-class Christians? That is one of the greatest lies of the Christian church is that if you don't preach or you don't sing or you don't do something public, you can't really be used by God in a big way. I want to let you know at this church, we believe that God is raising up shepherds that are going to be CEOs, entrepreneurs, school teachers, nurses, educators, mailmen. Are you hearing me today? I'm going to tell you why today. Because I believe that we live in a world full of scattered sheep. And I'll tell you that there is nothing that breaks the heart of our God more than sheep that do not have a shepherd. We know theologically that when sheep are not being led by a shepherd, they are vulnerable to predators. Most of you are actually being devoured right now. There's atheists in here right now. You're addicted to drugs. You're addicted to sex. You're addicted to all these things. And the, and the reason is, is you begin to wander at some point in your life. For most people, it's our teenage years. They say that most of the pain that we live with the rest of our life occurred to us before we turned 18. Some of the greatest counselors in the world, they don't even deal with the pain that happened to us after 18. They say most of the neurological damage done to our brains occurred to us in our childhood. You begin to wander. And I've learned this, that we don't wander because we're evil. We wander because we don't have a shepherd. We wander because we're hungry. And we're looking for something to satisfy us. You thought it was drugs. You thought it was sex. You thought it was porn. You thought it was something. And the more you drank the salt water, the faster you died. And I, want, I got news for you today that God is going to raise up a generation. You mark my words. Of not just pastors that know how to shepherd. Christians that know how to shepherd. If you believe it, shout a good amen. So I'm going to spend the next couple of weeks telling you what good shepherds do. Yeah. I'm going to talk to you about, a, about the good shepherd, and then I'm going to talk to you about becoming good shepherds. Yeah. Is that all right? Yeah. I've been trying to think of a creative title. I'm like, man, I'm just, I'm, I'm titled out. Yeah. It's hard to get a title than a message sometimes. Yeah. But I have a title for you today. It's Good Shepherds, The Good Shepherd, and Good Shepherds. Yeah. That's too long for you to just write this down. Training season. I actually believe that we are entering in, prophetically, to a season that God is going to train you. He's going to train us. Not to be a bunch of wandering sheep, doing what all the wandering sheep are doing in the world. I expect Babylon to act crazy. I expect people that don't know Jesus to live crazy. It is sad when the church wanders. I expect the world to wander, especially in an election year. We're going to see a lot of wandering. We're going to see a bunch of aimless people trying to go after things that would make them happy. Some of these wandering sheep think that a political party is the hope of the world. And look, I'm praying for righteous leaders, but I got news for you that it doesn't matter how righteous our leader is, only Jesus can save the human heart. We're going to vote for godly leaders, yes. We're going to vote for people that line up with our Bible worldview, yes. But at the end of the day, our hope is not in a donkey or an elephant. It's in the lion and the lamb. Amen. So we're going to be unshakable this year. Got your Bibles, John chapter 10. John chapter 10 is actually, uh, the story is about Jesus introducing himself in the New Testament as the good shepherd. And most people think about it's just in, like eternal consequence. Certainly there's some undertones there. 
But actually, if you're looking contextually at John chapter 10, the context of it is it happened after John chapter 9. I'll be here all morning. Tip your waitresses. I, uh, I learned this, that the story context is John chapter 9, there's a guy that's born blind. It stirs up this theological conversation with the disciples. They said, who sinned that he was born blind? His parents or him? God's like, you're both dumb. I didn't see it say that. was my translation. It's the Mark Francie living tra- no. <laughs> no, I'm uh, no, he goes, he goes, it wasn't for that. He said, this is so you can see the goodness of God. God heals this guy. One of the most uncomfortable miracles you'll ever read about. You ever try this miracle today, you'll probably get arrested. He literally spits in the ground, makes mud, baptizes his eyeballs with mud balls. Most painful miracle in the Bible. And somehow the mud with the, with the anointing of Jesus' saliva brings sight to his eyes. He sees. Now the Pharisees are losing their minds because it happened on the Sabbath. And I want you to know that when religion, when religion makes our liturgical practices more important than God, they worship the Sabbath more than the God of the Sabbath. Jesus says, what was made? Did God make men so we could have a Sabbath? Or did he make a Sabbath because he loves men? So they had that off. So he does this miracle on the Sabbath. They interrogate this blind guy that's now seeing. They can't deny the power of God because religion can't deny miracles. Some of you today, you don't believe in Jesus yet, but you're not going to be able to deny the miracles. There's someone in here, you have emphysema really bad. You can barely get a deep breath. And God's going to heal your lungs before the service is over. And you can do what you want with Jesus, but he's going to heal you today. And you're not going to be able to lie that God can't heal. That's real. So he heals a guy that's got this blindness. And after he heals him, he actually, uh, he, 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 he finds this guy. He gets excommunicated from the, from the church. Religion kicked a guy out because he got healed on the Sabbath and gave Jesus credit for it. So he's actually destitute. He's kicked out of the synagogue. Jesus finds him, goes after the lost sheep. And it's in that context that we start reading John chapter 10, Jesus being the good shepherd. If you're new today, I'm going to read 11 verses. I'm going to pray, tell a couple stories. I got six points, and then we're going to pray again. God's going to do something powerful. And we're going to leave and eat some good barbecue. This is the last day of my Daniel fast. I've been fantasizing about meat for some time now. I want to, my wife told me to tell you that uh, I ride mountain bikes. I've got a new mountain bike, so if you see more scratches on my arms, I'm doing good, okay? Just want to, some dark-minded people out there. Um, John chapter 10, you guys ready to go? Verse 7 says, Jesus said to them again, most surely I say to you, I am the door. What's Jesus? What's he the door to? To the what? To the sheep. Someone said, I don't know. God bless the honesty in this room. (laughs) I don't know. He's the door to the sheep. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door, and if anyone enters me, they will be saved. And will go in and come out and find good pasture. You know what the thief does? The thief comes to steal to kill, destroy. I want to tell you right now that any worldview that endorses killing, stealing, and destroying is not from the author of life. It's good by itself right there. Just drop that there. You play with that later. It says this. I, he, says, he says, but Jesus came that I may have life, that you may have life, and that you may more have it more... The word abundantly in the Greek language is the word zoe. It means, it means abundant life to the fullest. So hell comes to steal, kill, destroy. Jesus comes to give abundant life to the fullest. He says, I am the good shepherd. What's he say? I am the what? The good shepherd is good because he gives his life for the sheep. Hired hands don't do this. For he does not own the sheep. He sees a predator, a wolf coming. He leaves the sheep. He flees. The wolf will catch the sheep, scatter them. The hireling flees because he is a hireling and does not care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and I am known by my own. 
as the Father loves me, Jesus said, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also I must bring in. They will hear my What's the, what's the birthright of every son or daughter of God is to hear God's? I would say that one of the things that you got to get into your soul today is that God is a shepherd that speaks, and you are a sheep that should be able to hear his. Know my voice. And there will be one flock and one shepherd. Therefore, my father loves me because I lay down my life that I might take it up again. No one takes my life from me, but I lay it down to myself. I have the power to lay my life down, and I have the power to take it up. Evidence in a resurrected Christ. Know this, Jesus ruined every funeral he ever attended, including his own. This command I have received from my Father. You guys ready to go today? We're going to talk about the good shepherd, and then we're going to talk about becoming good shepherds. Y'all ready? Father, we thank you today that you're an awesome God. You take care of us, you lead us, you guide us, you feed us, you protect us. I pray today that if we don't know you intimately as the good shepherd, that today we'd get acquainted with you. This isn't the finish line, this is the starting line for for many. So God, today would would you fire the gun, and when we start our race with you, God, we love you today. I pray everyone that's far from you would experience you. All those that are close to you would get built up even more. And I pray that you would get all the glory and all the honor. Do what only you can do today in Jesus' mighty name. And all of God's people said a good old-fashioned amen. Amen. I want to talk to you today about training season. Training season. Someone say training season. Training season. I was was thinking about training. And, uh, you know, it's kind of crazy in, in life. There are so many things that don't require training. I was thinking about areas of life that uh, require licenses. Like to drive a car, you have to have a license. You want to go hunting? License. So my friends are like, you want to go hunting with me? I'm like, no, I don't want to sit with 10-year-olds. Take that hunting class. Just too embarrassed to go back, right? People get fishing license. You gotta get license for a lot of things. You, it's crazy. We live in a world that that's so protective over some things, and so reckless about other things. Isn't this wild? We, you literally gotta get a, you gotta get a license to have a firearm. You gotta get a license to go driving, to fly a plane, to fish. You gotta have a license to vote. Not in California. Tough crowd. Tough crowd. I know you do crazy. You got to have a license for a lot of things. You got to prepare. Someone say prepare. Prepare. We prepare for a lot of things in life. We prepare for marathons. My friend Ben ran 50 miles in Catalina. He prepared for that run. We prepare ourselves for all kinds of things, for, for sporting events. We prepare for big events at work. We prepare for an interview, for a new job. If you're, if you're leading the military, you prepare for war. There'll there'll come a day that you prepare for marriage. It's always funny to me that we'll spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on a wedding, but we won't even spend $20 on a book to enrich our marriage. We have a culture that idolizes days, but doesn't prepare for good lives. Training. Someone say training. I've seen it. I've seen it over and over and over again. People are literally, like, like, like we, we don't train. I think one of the things that blows my mind the most is why and how in the world do we not train young people to be parents? Like, I'm like, in school, we don't have, like, we don't have 30 minutes to prepare for being a parent. Like, 90% of you are going to have kids one day. Here's some information just in case. We can't carve that into the box. I'm wondering, I'm like scratching my head. I'm even thinking after we, we, uh, we, we trained for all kinds of stuff. We had our first kid. We, we had to get trained to like the birthing class. We're training to give birth to the baby. They have all kinds of literature about breathing techniques. Literature on an epidural. That's scary. All kinds of training. What blew my mind was there was no one that's like, hey, here's a book on how to be a parent. I don't know if you got, did you guys get the book? I don't know. You guys are quiet today. I was surprised. 
I'll never forget the first day Rochelle left me in charge. I was so scared. Rochelle had to go somewhere, and I'm like, man, babe, you don't understand. Dads, we're like, we're like the backup quarterback in the NFL. I'm on the team, but when you need me to go in, everybody's nervous. I'm like, I don't know. I don't know. Like, I didn't even know how to put the car seat in the car. I'm old enough to remember when seat belts were not, like, mandatory. My car seat growing up was called Aunt Colleen. <laughs> Aunt Colleen threw her fingers. That was a seat belt of the millennial generation. We had seating in the back of the station wagon that faced towards oncoming cars. It was a different era of time. They said, do you know how to put the car seat? I'm like, I have no idea. They're like, you go to the fire department. I'm not fucking going to bother a fireman. This guy's saving lives, putting out fires. I'm not going to go in there and be like, hey, Joe, Joe, come on outside. I want to waste an hour of your life. Like, These guys aren't getting paid enough. They're putting in car seats. Training. Someone say Training. You know, what I was thinking about is we have a lot of people that we understand that training works. We go to masterminds and master classes and have coaches and we have trainers and all those things are amazing. But I was thinking about this idea and I heard the Lord saying this, that there's a generation of people that are literally wandering aimlessly, being devoured by the beast of the field. I'm going to talk about it next week. You don't want to miss next week. Ezekiel 34 is an indictment against a generation that has unhealthy shepherds. The indictment is because you don't take care of the sheep, you want the food that they provide without caring for them. He says because you don't care for the sheep, they wander. And when sheep wander, they're vulnerable. I don't know if you know this, but sheep have no defense mechanisms. They have no defense. They don't have bear claws. They don't have jaguar speed. Are you hearing me? They don't swim like sharks. They are literally pretty defenseless animals. And the saving grace of every sheep is, is the company of a shepherd. Most people don't realize that God is the good shepherd. Notice it says he's not just a shepherd, he's the good shepherd. There's only two words in the Greek language that for good, there's agathos, which describes the moral quality of something being good, and there's kalos, which means the goodness therein that has a certain charm which makes it lovely. And the word that's used here in the good shepherd is the one that means there is something in God that is so charming that it's lovely. He is a charming, lovely shepherd. People in the ancient world, they look to kings and prophets as shepherds. Great leaders are great shepherds. I would go on the record to say that usually before God will trust you with people, he'll see if you can shepherd something small. You know, in the ancient world, it was, a very, it was a very low social economic vocation to be a shepherd. It was, the least, it was the least desirable chore of the family. So much so that if you had boys, it would always be the youngest child that would be the shepherd. That's why David, what did David do the day he killed Goliath? He left the sheep with somebody and he delivered pizza. He said it was cheese and grain, ladies and gentlemen. G David was a pizza delivery guy. He was a shepherd. He was in the field with the sheep. Moses spent 40 years in the, in the desert with the, with the sheep. Abraham was a shepherd. Isaac was a shepherd. Jacob was a shepherd. The sons of Israel were shepherds. You know what the irony is? I didn't say this last service, but it's interesting. When you read in the book of Genesis about Joseph, when he was telling his family how the protocol of Egypt worked, he warned them and said, guys, be quiet with the shepherd stuff because Egypt, they disdain shepherds. And I believe that even today, the world disdains shepherds. The world doesn't celebrate others that live selfless. The world doesn't celebrate people that live for others and not for themselves. They make fun of people that live like us. But make no mistake about it, before God raises up someone with authority, he'll ask the question, do they have a shepherd's heart? Do they have a shepherd's heart? 
You know what Jesus wept over in Israel? He wept over the city because they were sheep without a. You no, know it breaks God's heart. Is your workplace that has no shepherds? You know what breaks God's heart is your classroom that has no shepherds. You know what breaks God's heart? Your coffee shop that has no. You know what breaks God's heart is these big events that have no. And the problem is, is there's a lot, of, a lot of buzz around people that are about kingdom entrepreneurship and kingdom business, but they dishonor the church. Those aren't shepherds. These are people that use the church to get rich themselves. That isn't a shepherd. The shepherd don't monetize the sheep. They lay their lives down for the sheep. I'm preaching to somebody today. Do you know that anybody that preaches the kingdom and dishonors the church, I, will, I want to inform you today, the kingdom is not anti-church. The church is not anti-kingdom. Let me give you a theological base, baseline. Is The message is the kingdom. The messenger is the church. I just had to do a little chiropractic adjustment there. Because this county is full of all these rogue people. They don't have a church home. They don't have kids that are serving God. They're in a broken relationship, but they're monetizing sheep. And I want you to know the heart of the shepherd is to give their life to the sheep, not take the life of the sheep. You know what good shepherds do is they lead the sheep. They lead them. They say, follow me, like Paul said, as I follow the ancient world, the biggest difference between the Palestinians in the ancient world, in Palestine, excuse me, the Jews in Palestine, and the modern, uh, like, or even like looking at like Britain, is the way they, they raise sheep. In Britain, they would raise, shepherds would raise sheep to eat them. They would raise lambs to kill them. But in Israel, in the ancient world, they raised lambs for their wool. And because they raised them for their wool, they knew them longer. And because they knew them longer, they would name them. And because they walked with them for so long, they knew their nature. And because they knew their nature and their character and their personality, they began to know their needs. This is what good shepherds do. They're not trying to raise up the people around them to kill them, to get rich quick. They're trying to raise them up to put wool on them. Are you hearing me today? And I, I want to just, I want to let you know that, you know, it's interesting. You know why Joseph was hated by his brothers? Because he was the youngest and he should have been in the field. But his father loved him so much that he said, no, I'll, I'll send your brothers in the field in your place. It's crazy that if, if in the ancient world, if you didn't have sons, there were shepherdesses. Rachel was a shepherdess. She was out there with the sheep. We know that for some reason, whether it was Moses, David, Jacob, Joseph, God seemed to delight in raising up people that knew how to take care of sheep. Well, it's just the old covenant preacher. No, God's in all of the Bible. How about Luke chapter 2? When Jesus is born, he sends an angel choir to the earth. And guess who they sing for? A bunch of shepherds in a field. It's wild that Jesus comes to Peter. He says, Peter, you deny me three times. He tried to quit his vocational ministry. He tried to go back to fishing. He, got, he caught nothing all night. But it's interesting that after he obeyed the voice of Jesus, he caught over 150 fish. He came to shore, and the last conversation, the last one that Peter has with him before the, day of, before the, the book of Acts is Jesus says to Peter, Peter, do you love me? Yeah. yeah. Feed my sheep. On this rock, I'm going to build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. What kind of, what kind of person are we going to do that? It's a person that loves the sheep. Yeah. Second time, Peter, do you love me? Yeah. Jesus, you know everything. You know I love you. But take care of my lambs. Yeah. Yeah. Peter, third time, do you love me? Peter's dejected. God, you know everything. But I believe that the reason scholars say that maybe God, God prodded him three times because Peter denied him three times. And it was as though God was reinforcing that your vocation hasn't changed because you failed. Purpose is the same. You're going to give your life to leading, to feeding, to caring, to raising, to protecting my people. 
I want to remind you that the greatest natural resource on the earth is not oil or gold. The greatest, the greatest, most valuable thing on the planet is people. Problem is we live in a world that says, no, it's about gold, glory, and girls. But you can never get enough glory, you can never get enough girls, and you can never get enough gold. The Bible says your eyes are like death and hell. They're never satisfied. They're never full. That's why someone that makes a million dollars says, I need to make 10 million. And the guy that makes 10 million goes, I got to make 100 million. And the guy that was 100 million goes, I got to make a billion. And the billionaire goes, I got to make 10 billion. And we're always jockeying for more. You know, I'm not saying that God doesn't want you to go after great things, accomplish great things. I'm simply saying we can't use people to get things. We have to know that God will give us things to reach people. God is raising up a generation of good shepherds. If you believe it, shout a good amen. He said, I am the good shepherd. You know what good shepherds do is they walk with the sheep. One thing that will make you a shepherd is you will smell like sheep. There is a lot of churches that are pastored by speakers but not shepherds. A speaker is someone that will inspire you. A shepherd is someone that will walk with you. I had a friend in our church that I never, I grew up in church my whole life, never saw the value of it until I went through a storm. It wasn't until my child got sick, until we buried a family member. It wasn't until I went through some of the hardships of life that I realized, man, there is something powerful about having a shepherd. It's crazy. You see the value in having a good CPA. You see the value in having a good lawyer. You see the value in having a good coach or trainer. You see the value in those things, but most people don't realize there is a value with having someone in your life that knows your name, knows your nature, and knows your need. And here's the great news. You don't have to have a pastor in front of your name to be a shepherd. I believe that God wants all of his kids to graduate from believing to becoming a disciple. And we could, we come, when we become real disciples, the next step is to become a disciple maker. Ladies and gentlemen, it's not your height, it's not your weight, it's not your facial hair, gentlemen, that makes you mature. What makes you mature, true maturity is only gauged by one thing. It is in your ability to reproduce. That's how we know when you become an adult. And I want you to know spiritually, it's not how many church services you go to, how many Christian schools you attended, how many church services you sit in. Here's the question. Is there someone in this room that's here because you are reproducing your faith in them? True disciples make disciples. But if there's no one in your world that knows you're, you have a faith in God, I would say, if anything, at best, you're a fan of Jesus, you're not a disciple of Jesus. Because disciples pursue maturity to the point they want to produce other disciples. I want to remind you, shepherds don't just draw followers, they draw leaders. And God told me that, Mark, you're not pastoring a bunch of sheep that are followers. You're pastoring a bunch of lions. You're pastoring a bunch of leaders. You're... I'm talking about you today. Come on, give God a hand clap. God is raising up some men and women of God that are going to give direction to their industries. When everybody else is freaking out about the stock market, you have the confidence of God. When everybody else is putting their hands up going, we don't know what to do with the educational system, you have the wisdom of God. When everybody else says there's no water flowing in the economy, you're finding out where the, where the dam is. There's always water flowing upstream. And I believe for some of you today, you got to realize that God's desire for you isn't just to bless you. It's to make you a blessing to somebody else. If you live for you and you're successful, the only thing that will remember you is maybe a statue built after you. That's the story of Absalom. Absalom had to build a statue. He was beautiful. It says he was the best looking guy in the kingdom. The most gifted guy in the kingdom. He had this long Fabio hair. Some old people in this tent. <laughs> he was this dazzling, good-looking guy. But the Bible says he was so selfish, so into himself, so into using people to build his kingdom, that when he died, hanging by his hair. So here's what I know. If you don't raise up other people, your gifts could hang you. The things you're bragging about right now could be the guillotine that takes off your head. 
He was, he was suspended in the air by what people used to brag about how great it was. He has the best hair in the kingdom. Well, it was the very hair that one, once everyone bragged about that got him stuck in a tree. And as he was suspended from heaven to earth, it says that, that this general Joab got all of his armor bearers, there was like 17 of them, and they threw spears into his heart. You know what's crazy? It says after he was done, after he was dead, the only thing to remember his existence was a monument of, of stone that he built in his lifetime. You know what David's greatest accomplishment was? It wasn't his kingship killing Goliath. It wasn't his songwriting ability. His greatest accomplishment was Solomon. Do you know why God wants to raise you up as a shepherd? Because shepherds will pass on legacy. How do you know that? I'm telling you that God cares more about who you're pouring into than what you accomplish. Prove that biblically. I'll, I'll prove it to you. You know, Moses, God mentions 99 times. Moses, by God, was mentioned 99 times. You know how many times Joshua was mentioned by God? Two times. What was the difference? Well, Moses got the promise. Joshua went into the promised land. Technically speaking, Joshua finished what Moses started. But he was only mentioned twice, and Moses referenced 99 times. Let's go on to another case study. How about Elijah and Elisha? Elijah is mentioned 27 times by God. Elisha does twice the amount of miracles, and he's mentioned once by God. What was the commonality? The second generation did more, but they didn't pass it on. Some of you got to realize today that your job isn't just to get to heaven. It's to get heaven into your kids. It's to get heaven into the next generation. It's to get heaven into your grandkids. It's to get heaven into your coworkers. Are you hearing me today? We got to fight to be good shepherds that aren't just in it for us. We're in it for others. If you believe it, give God 10 seconds of crazy praise. It's wild. Great shepherds aren't just, they're, they're, they're two things. Great shepherds are both doctors and they are detectives. Great shepherds know how to strengthen the weak like a doctor. They know how to bring healing to the sick like a doctor. They know how to bind up the brokenhearted like a doctor. But I've learned this, that you have to be with people to diagnose people. And that's why some of you aren't shepherds. You're delegating loving people to somebody else. There's some things in life you can't delegate. Your prayer life. Your Bible reading time and loving people personally. You can't hire an assistant for that. You can't hire a bookkeeper for that. These are things that are personal only to you. You know what they did during COVID is they started doing Zoom calls for doctor's appointments. And there was all these lawsuits because there was misdiagnosis. Doctors couldn't see over Zoom if it was eczema or if it was leprosy. And because they diagnosed it wrong, they prescribed it wrong. There is something about being in the room that helps you diagnose the problem. Look, I'm not against church online. We offer it, but let, make no mistake about it. No one's getting pregnant on FaceTime. There is something about being in the room. Can I get a witness in the church? There is something about physically being in an atmosphere of faith that imparts to you in a way that you don't get over a FaceTime call. Too strong in this service? I feel the heart of God saying there's too many sheep getting slaughtered. And they're getting slaughtered in commerce. They're getting slaughtered in the business world. They're getting slaughtered in entertainment. They're getting slaughtered in media. They're getting slaughtered in education. They're getting slaughtered in healthcare and politics because there's no one in my church that's saying, I'll be a shepherd here. Where are the shepherds at? Where are the people that have laid down their life? Our job is to doctor and strengthen the weak. And our job is to be a detective, to bring back the lost. The Bible says know the state of your flocks. Know the state of your children. Know the state of your grandchildren. 
I don't know what it is pastorally. I know I'm a pastor, so this is maybe a little bit stronger gift in me than others. But I'll tell you, it's the weirdest thing. I can feel so many times, not just for me and my family, I can feel for you guys. God, I'll put one of you in my head. I'll just start praying for you. I'm like, they need this right now. There's guys that stopped going to our church for two years, and over the two years, I would pray for them every week. God will give me a text message to send them every month. And a lot of them started coming back to our church. And they said the same thing. They said, Mark, thank you for not giving up on me. I said, I couldn't. I couldn't forget about the way that God loves you. I couldn't forget the good plans that God has for your family. I couldn't just push it aside. Rochelle and I made up our minds a long time ago that we will give up on nobody. You can leave Ocean's Church. The door will always be open for you. Good shepherds aren't in it for themselves. The problem is, is we don't have shepherds nowadays. We have speakers. And you know the difference between a speaker and a shepherd? If you bite a shepherd, they won't bite you back. We don't have the luxury of getting offended at our sheep. You bite a speaker, they'll bite you back. Luke 15 says to lead the 99 and go after the one. It's thinking about how important this is. God is looking for a generation that says God will be your shepherds. You know, Psalms 22 talks about the good shepherd dying for his sheep. Psalms 23 talks about the good shepherd living for his sheep. Psalms 24 talks about the chief shepherd coming for his sheep. We're going to talk more about this in the weeks to come. But I was thinking about the, the first shepherd in the Bible was Abel in Genesis chapter 4. And the last, the last passage on the shepherd is in 1 Peter 5, 2. It says, shepherd the flock of God that is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, not willingly, uh, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, not as being lords over the people entrusted to you, but by being example to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, here's the last, last use of the word shepherd in the New Testament. When the chief shepherd appears, you will receive a crown of glory that does not fade away. You know what the reward is of living your life as a shepherd? Crown of glory. I believe God wants us to shepherd the flock that is among us. I want to just land on a couple points. Can you guys give me a few more minutes? I'm almost done. I noticed that God referred to himself as Jehovah Rohi, which means the Lord is my shepherd. David would write this about God because David knew something about shepherds that most people never knew. He was a shepherd. You know what's powerful about Jesus is he's the only one in history that was both the lamb and the shepherd. He was both the offering and the offerer. And God says, I am the good shepherd. And you got to understand this. Most people don't understand this. Jesus came for three reasons. Theologically, he came in the flesh for three reasons. He came to actually pay for all sins. Someone say amen. Amen. We sing about the blood today. You're like, why are we singing about blood? Because it was in the sacrificial blood that we're forgiven. So when you get forgiven of your sins, you're like, thank you for what you did on the cross. He paid for our sins. Number two, he fulfilled all the prophetic words. Scholars call this fulfilling all righteousness. And number three, you know why Jesus came? To give us an example. To give us an example to follow in. And here's the problem with some of your dysfunctional Christianity. You say you love Jesus, but you don't live anything like Jesus. You don't value how he lives. Here's the question that real Christians ask. Is Jesus into what I'm into? And if he's not, you know what you do? You let God change you to please God. You don't change God to please you. I don't read the Bible cutting and pasting what I like, what I don't like. If you disagree with the Bible, you have two choices. You can edit the Bible to make you feel good, or you can let God edit you to make God feel good. I promise you one leads to emptiness and hypocrisy and and Chaldeans, and the other one leads to those that hunger and thirst for what is right and are full. Today, I felt this strong burden that God says, I'm raising up an army of shepherds out of Ocean's Church. Here's what I know about sheep. When sheep are abused and sheep are beaten, they'll stop reproducing. 
frightened, fearful, or abused sheep can't conceive, and if they do, they'll miscarry. It's only the sheep that are at peace and that are calm that can multiply. You know why it's so important to be in a healthy local church? Because it puts a peace in your family. It puts a peace in your marriage, your business, that causes you to begin to be fruitful and multiply. How do you know? I lived this for 17 years. That's self-serving. You're a pastor. No, I was a sheep in a church for 17 years. And I promise you, there is fruit that you'll produce in the house of God that you would never produce living outside of the fold. There is a protection. There is a safety. You know why? Because when you're around good shepherds, they strengthen the weak, number one. You know what God wants to do? He wants to train you how to strengthen the weak. But here's what I want to tell you. You're not going to strengthen weak people until you get strong. You can only feed others if you feed yourself. And that's some of your problems. You're feeding people a bunch of mixture. You don't read the Bible. You live by the gospel of feelings. Why well, don't we like the Bible, preacher? Well, you should. Uh, no, I love Jesus, but I don't like the Bible. Um, that's like saying uh, I'm Italian, but I don't like pasta. I don't like lasagna or spaghetti. I don't like pizza. No, like you, you probably do. It's actually a stronger metaphor than that. You know how strong it is? John goes on the record to say that Jesus Christ is the Word made flesh. So let me remind you today, if you don't like the Bible, that if Jesus was a book, and He is, His name would be the Word of God. 66 books reflect the nature of one person. So that should settle that argument pretty quick. Good shepherds strengthen the weak. Number two, good shepherds heal the sick. You know what the Holy Spirit's here to do today? Heal the sick. Not only will He heal the sick, number three, He will bind up the broken. Some of you are brokenhearted today, and God will bind you up. How good was Felicia's story? If God could bind her heart up after a, a hardship that few of us could ever fathom, what could God do for you? I heard one scholar say, if God can make a fly's butt light up, what could God do for you? It's powerful. Number four, good shepherds will bring you back if you've been driven away. The Bible says that those that have fallen, those of you that are mature, those of you that are shepherds, go after those that have fallen, but do it with a spirit of gentleness, lest you enter into the same temptation that they fell into. The problem in the Christian world today is when shepherds fall, sheep gets rocks. And I'm telling you that this is not going to be one of those churches. Jesus said, those without sin throw the first stone. The good news is, none of us can grab a rock. All have fallen short. You know, great, great shepherds, they bring back those driven away. And number five, great shepherds will seek the lost. We're a church that prays every week for family members that don't know God yet. Some of you are like, really? Yeah, that's probably why you're here today. That's probably why you're getting emotional right now. That's why you feel like God is knocking on the door of your heart right now. You know what that is? That's called the answer to someone's prayer. You know why I'm on this platform? Because I had a grandma and a grandpa that prayed for me before I was born. Dedicated me when I was a little child. They prayed for me when I wandered for God 18 years. Truth is, you can run from God, but when people are praying from you, you can't outrun God. At some point, His goodness will catch up to you and tackle you with the goodness of God. And the last thing is good shepherds lead with vision and kindness, not with cruelty and force. We live in a world that drives people, but shepherds lead people. In the ancient world, Palestinian shepherds, you know what they would do? Is they would lead their sheep. They would go ahead of them. They would anoint them with oil so they didn't get sunstroke. When flies got into their skull, they would anoint their noses. The oil would kill the, the bugs in their nose. And if they didn't get the anointing, you know what happened? Is the sheep would beat their head against a rock until they died. Trying to get rid of the pain. We have a generation addicted to pills trying to get rid of the pain. Addicted to pornography, trying to get rid of the pain. We got people doing all kinds of crazy things because there's something in your mind.
that only the anointing of the shepherd can heal. But there is a shepherd in heaven that binds up the brokenhearted, that heals those that are downtrodden. His anointing will break every yoke, every hex, every vex, every generational curse. Come on, if you believe it, give him 10 seconds of crazy praise. Feel God in this place today. He is the good shepherd. You know, I love Psalm 79, 13. It says, when your people, the flock of your pasture, will give you praise forever. Do you know why we praise forever? Because we know the quality of how good our shepherd is. I promise, if you know how good God is to you, you wouldn't sing like this. You wouldn't be looking at your watch right now going, when's this guy going to be finished? Do you know what your problem is? It's you don't, you're not healthy spiritually. And I know you're not healthy because you have no appetite for God. And when you're sick, the first thing you lose is your appetite. I never want to stand up in this place. I feel, the whole, I feel the anointing coming in here today. You know what God will do if you get hungry for Him? He'll show Himself to you. The problem with some of you is, is you're so full of yourself that you have no appetite for God. But here's the good news today. You can, you can pray a prayer and invite the Holy Spirit to say, God, show me how good the good shepherd is. And I want to know you as the good shepherd that what? You, str you strengthen my weakness. You heal my sickness. You bind up my brokenness. You bring back the areas that I've drifted in. You seek me out when I'm lost and wandering. You lead me with vision and kindness. You know what the difference is? I heard a guy in ancient in, in, in uh, actually, it, it, was, it was actually recent, and he was in Israel, and he said, I saw on the tour, the tour guide said, real shepherds will lead their sheep. All shepherds lead their sheep. But he saw a guy driving the sheep. And this little know-it-all in, in, in the tour bus raises his hand. He said, hey, I thought shepherds lead the sheep, not drive them. Why is that shepherd driving the sheep? And the tour guide goes, oh, that's easy. He's not a shepherd. He's a butcher. We live in a world butchering, wandering sheep. And I'm telling you why you got to feed yourself the Word of God. Because you will lead the sheep around you with the food you feed yourself. And I want to give you a disclaimer today. It's my responsibility to do this. Here's my disclaimer. If you're not eating good food, the only thing that's scarier than being wrong is feeding people wrong food. Now, I know some of you are leaders by, na by nature. Some of you have huge organizations that follow you. I'm telling you, listen to me, friends. It is so important every day that you read this book and say, God, I don't want to preach my opinion. I don't want some hybrid pseudo-Christianity that has a form of godliness but denies the power therein. I promise you right now, I'm telling you, this, listen, this is where John Bevere's message, the fear of God comes in. Jesus said this, if you teach young people or young Christians the wrong way, Jesus said it'd be better for you to get a rope tied around your neck with a brick attached to it and thrown off a bridge into water. Jesus doesn't talk that strong very often. But when he does, it's in the context of if you're going to lead you better lead with good food. Good food. Good food. We got a generation quoting Tony Robbins, but not Jesus Christ. They don't need the CEO quote. They need the quote of Jesus Christ. This is the only book that saves. This is the only word that delivers. This is the only literature that God guarantees. I feel something in here today. So here's my... Here's my practical handlebar today. If we're going to actually strengthen the weak, we got to let God strengthen us. Today, I'm not asking you. I'm sure you're probably physically ripped. Some of you would spend 10% of the time you spend in the gym reading your Bible. You'd be working at this church. It's crazy. We, we value fitness. We value coaching, which I'm not, I think you should do all that. Lord knows I need to do more of it. Can I get an amen? But here's what I know is that we can't do one at the expense of the other. Paul says physical 
Fitness is good in certain areas, but he says godliness is profitable for every area. So here's my prayer. I'm not, I'm not, please keep working out. I'm not saying that. Keep your gym membership. Amen. I'm holding the jokes back just for a second. But here's what I need you to do is we got to prioritize. Lord, I want to create a lifestyle. And here's my practical, here's my, my homework assignment is I'm going to ask you every day to make a time and make a place to read this book. I know this is like 101. You guys are like, I've been doing that for 40 years. Awesome. Here's what I want those of you that have been doing it for 40 years. I need you to start saying, God, who do you want me to shepherd now? Because remember this, your maturity is not based on how much of this book you know. Your maturity is reflected on how much of this book you live. Do you live it? Are you reproducing this in somebody else? You know Joel Faust? He's been in my small group since he was 12. You know Dan Dunson? He's around here somewhere. He's in my small group since he was 13. You know Melanie Faust that sings? In Rochelle's small group since she was in junior high. Pastor Stephanie Dunson. In Rochelle's small group since she was in ninth grade. I got probably, there's probably 15 guys that have been with me for longer than 20 years. Serving God. Businessmen, entrepreneurs, pastors, healthy marriages. Kids love Jesus. That's called fruit. Fruit doesn't lie. And I just want to, I'm going to push in a little bit harder. Some of you that are modeling to your kids what it looks like to turn the TV off and say, as a family, we're going to pray. Men, I'm talking to you right now. Stop letting your wives lead the house. They can lead with you, but you need to start being a part of leading. And I'm telling you right now, there's a lot of women that are just naturally spiritually minded and they're praying, but some of you guys got to start stepping up. You know what's the cool thing? I took my daughter on a bike ride yesterday. I did tell my wife this. Touched my heart. My daughter asked me questions. She goes, Daddy, it was as pure and as honest as any eight-year-old could ever be. She said, Daddy, what do people that don't know Jesus do on Sundays? My daughter has never not been on church on Sundays. You're a pastor. I know. But I'm still saying my lifestyle is we love the house of God. Let me say something, parents. What you tolerate with your kids, they'll interpret as your approval. So when you treat church as optional, please don't get mad when one day they view it as non-essential. When we value sporting events more than the house of God, Sports camps more than church camps. Listen to me. Education in sports without Jesus makes more athletic and smart devils. So here's what my prayer is today. We're going to start by shepherding our kids. Can I do an altar call today? How many feel like God is asking you to become a good shepherd? Not just a shepherd, but a good shepherd. You gotta start feeding yourself. How many feel like, God, I gotta step up what I'm eating? I I gotta eat better spiritually. I think we'd all eat better, maybe physically, but who wants to eat better spiritually? Would you raise your hands right now? I wanna eat more, maybe. I wanna eat better. I I wanna start meditating on God's word. I wanna chew on it. The word meditation in the Bible doesn't mean meditation, it actually means not to empty your mind. That's what Eastern religions do. Christian meditation is filling your mind, it's taking a verse and just thinking about it. You know what meditation is? In the Hebrew language, it means to have a, it means as a cow chews on its cud. A curd, whatever it is. That's meditation. How many want to meditate on God's word? This week, Lord, I'm going I'm to dedicate every morning this week or every night. Morning or night, who would just say, I don't normally do that, but I'm going to start doing that every day. So give me a wave real quick. I'm going to start doing that every day. Raise your hand. I'm going to pray for you, Lord. I'm asking for a revival of men and women that don't just podcast, they love the Word. We got people that can quote sermons but not scriptures. We got people that can sing church songs but don't know the book of Psalms. I'm asking that you would ignite a new passion. 
that we would raise up disciples that were say, that become disciple makers. I ask you to raise up good shepherds, people that know the good shepherd and become a good shepherd. You're our example, Jesus. Train us in the ways of your kingdom in Jesus' name. Now, all over this room, that's you today. Say, Mark, I want God to make me a good shepherd. I want you to grab your neighbor's hand. I know it's sweaty. Grab it, though, anyways. There's something about remembering that we're family here. God told me I'm not pastoring a church of sheep. He said, Rochelle and, Rochelle and I are pastoring a church full of shepherds. Father, you're a shepherd. Kim, you're a shepherd. Joy, Jason, you're a shepherd. Dion, you're a shepherd. Jim, you're a shepherd. Mark, you're a shepherd. You hear me today? So I want you to declare this over your neighbor. Say, in Jesus' name, I ask you, Holy Spirit, give them an appetite of a good shepherd to love your word, to love to pray, and to love the people around them. No longer selfish, but living selfless, humble, gentle, teachable, kind, in Jesus' name. Full of power, full of wisdom, full of grace, and anointing to shepherd starting with their family in Jesus name awesome you let go of that sweaty hand let's give God a hand clap today God's raising up some who believes God's raising some shepherds up in this church last two things we do and I'll wrap it up we do this every week God told me there was someone here that you've been suicidal and you've been suicidal because you've been living your own life God says you want to have fun start living the life that I made you to live the only one that can give meaning to life is the one that gave your life. You're here today. Someone has some sort of a bulimia. You've been bulimic, I think, for like 16 or 17 years. God's going to deliver you today. It's going to be so awesome. Feel the Holy Spirit in here. There's someone here that's Bell's palsy. You've lost feeling in your face or somewhere in your, just feel like you've gone numb. God's going to restore you right now. There's someone here, you have some sort of kidney, you've been on dialysis, God's going to heal your kidney or, or, or provide some sort of kidney transplant. It's going to be mirac It's going to be miraculous one way or the other. I just believe God is healing right now. Someone just is in the middle of going through a divorce, spouse just left you, and God is going to bind up your broken heart. I don't know what you're praying for. Maybe it's having kids. Maybe it's grandkids. Someone's been praying for your, your, your daughter or, or granddaughter to marry a godly man. And I actually believe God's going to answer that prayer this week. God's going to do some cool things in your family. You guys ready to go? So all over the room, if you need a miracle, a touch from God, maybe get set free from something, or you're just here to say, God, would you please help me today? Would you lift your hand? It doesn't make you weird. It makes you honest. You know the Drill Oceans Church, if someone has their hand up next to you, just put a hand on their shoulder. It's very biblical. The Bible says we lay hands on those in need, those that are sick, those that are in need of healing, those that are in need of deliverance, and God will respond to the prayer of a righteous man or a righteous woman. Ocean's Church, you know the drill. Say it like this. Say, in Jesus' name. Come on, say, Holy Spirit, we invite you right now to do signs, to do wonders, to do miracles. We ask you to heal the brokenhearted. We ask you to heal and deliver addictions, bondages, generational curses, broken now in the name of Jesus Christ. We prophesy a week of signs, wonders, miracles, gifts of healings, and the working of miracles in Jesus' name. Top of their head, bottom of their feet. Holy Spirit, do right now what only you can do. He's coming. Just give him a second. He's coming right now. Some of you are going to physically feel it. He's here right now. Who would say five minutes extra would be worth it if someone was never the same? 
He's moving right now. I want to sing this song before we do. I want to pray this. He's healing someone right now. But I believe there's like 20 people in this service. And everyone look at me. Stop praying for the person. Look at me just for a second. I feel God in this. It's like 20 of you, I think, today. 19 or 20. That you know right now, you've been living for everything except Jesus. I'm not asking, do you believe in God? I'm asking, are you living your life for Jesus and with Jesus? If you want to pull Jesus out of the shotgun seat of your life and put him in the driver's seat today. Some of you, God's not even in the car. We're going to invite God in for the first time. But there is many today that God is in your life, but he's not the Lord of your life. We're raising disciples here, not just believers. You guys ready to go? If you're here today and you want to rededicate your life to God, put him in the driver's seat. Or for the first time, say, God, if you are real, I want to know you and I want to live for you. I'm out of time. I want to sing one last song. I want to get you out of here. That's you. One, I want you to raise your hand on the count of three. Two, Holy Spirit, let everyone that needs to come back today come back right now. Every eye closed, every head bowed. Three, real high, I want you to raise your hand. That's me. That's me. That's me. That's me. That's me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Real high. Keep it up. Keep it up. Keep it up. I see five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Anybody else? Real high. Eleven. Real high. Real high. Eleven. Real high. Twelve. Real high. Real high. Thirteen. I see behind the TV. I see fourteen in the very back. Anybody else? Holy Spirit, come right now. Right now. Fourteen. Put your hands down. I believe there's five more. At least five more. Your heart is getting ready to go to cardiac arrest. It's beating out of your chest. I know God is inviting me in right now to start a journey. Listen, this is not a finish line. This is a starting line. We want to live for God and with God. All the way. For God, with God. All the way. You didn't raise your hand. Eyes closed. No one's looking. There's five more of you. I know God speaks to me. Five more. I don't have time to, be, to, to, to belabor this. I just need you to pop your hand up right now. I'll give you three seconds. One, five more of you. Thank you. Two, five more of you. There's another one. Three, real high. That's me. That's me. That's me. I see two. I see three. Real high. I know, I know it. Four. No, there's one more. 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 Yay. I see four. I know there's five. Is there another one over there, Nathaniel? There's five people. Well, give God a hand clap real quick. That's 19. No one God speaks to me. You know what's cool? That 19th person that responded, God's healing your neck right now. He's doing something so cool right now. There's someone in here, you have some sort of rash on your leg. God's healing it right now. I want you to pray with those 19. Say, Jesus. I ask you today to help me right now turn from darkness, turn from wickedness to the living God. I believe you are alive, you are the Son of God, and I invite you in all the way. Fill me with your Holy Spirit, forgive me of my past, and lead me from this day forward in Jesus' name. Give me a love for the Bible, give me a local church, and give me friends that can show me your way in Jesus' name. Can we sing one song to celebrate? I feel something in here right now. Let's sing one song to celebrate right now. Give those people a hand clap that just gave their life to the Lord. Let's sing one time.
Come on, tell them. Come on, give him a hand clap this morning. He's an awesome God. Give him a good hand clap. Give someone a high five. Tell him you love him. And grab a seat.